Hi everyone, my name is Pranoti and I'm the host of Under the Microscope and today we have with us Lisa McCallvy White who is a Crow professor and chair department chair at the University of Florida in the US and I'm totally going to ask her where does the crow professor come from so Lisa welcome to under the microscope lovely to have you how are you I'm great thanks and the crow professorship is an endowed professorship in the department of chemistry at the University of Florida and this came from a gift from one of our alumni colonel Alan Crow who left the department a rather sizable bequest in his will. And so when he passed away, the money came to the department and we put it in an endowment and the income from the endowment funds two professorships in chemistry, along with some undergraduate and graduate uh, fellowships as well. Wow, that's really cool. And what is, wh why did he, thank you, Colonel Crow, of course. Um, but why, like, did he have, like, why? I mean, I mean, yeah. honestly, we don't know. Oh. Usually money that's left to the department is subject to a gift, gift agreement mm -hmm. through the University of Florida Foundation. But this was not. This merely popped up in his will. And when he passed away, the money came to the department with some instructions, mm -hmm. uh, but no real strings attached to it. And this is what we did with the money. Oh, that is so cool. I hope more and more people so, do that. Yes. Interestingly enough, the other Crow professor is uh, Charles Martin, who works in the area of nanotechnology as well. Nice. Okay, we need to get Charles uh, as well. This another Crow professor on the podcast for sure. <laughs> excellent. Excellent. So, Lisa, um, tell me about your research. Tell me, tell me, tell me about your research. So, what do you do? Uh, first of all, your research is funded by the National Science Foundation. And by the Semiconductor Research Corporation. Yes. So, yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, so my group has a really strange expertise. Mm -hmm. We make precursors for the deposition of, well, either 3D deposition nanostructures or thin films of materials. Mm -hmm. And as synthetic chemists, we have a, a strange uh, portfolio, right? So we arrange the chemistry that is involved in all these techniques. And so because people who do depositions, especially the 3D nanoprinting, have a different skill set, right? They're usually engineers or applied physicists or material scientists. The ability to synthesize chemical precursors across a variety of techniques is almost unique to my group. There are a lot of people who do a single technique mm -hmm. and that's what they do. But since our expertise is really mechanistic chemistry and precursor development, we collaborate with people who do a lot of different techniques, mm -hmm. either regular chemical vapor deposition, which is a thermal process, right? So the chemistry is run by heat. Right. We collaborate with people who do uh, photo assisted deposition. So the energy for running the chemistry is now light. Mm -hmm. uh, we also collaborate with people who do electron beam and ion beam deposition, but we're the chemists in the room. Oh, wow. Okay. Okay. Wait, wait, wait. Okay. So it's 3D printing or printing or deposition, right? Nanoscale or atomic scale. Well, let's call it molecular or nanoscale. And yeah, sure. you would be the go to group if I want uh, not the ink, but yeah, kind of like the ink. For the three D print, yeah, ink printing. works. Yeah. So okay, so this ink, ooh, so it can be any kind of ink. It can be like metal, or is there like only polymer, or like okay, now ooh, tell me. Uh, it can be done with with anything that you can volatilize into the gas phase. So the trick is always be able to get the compound evaporated uh -huh. and moved into where you're doing the deposition. Right. And so if you tell me I want to deposit, say, ruthenium, mm -hmm. right? So what we can do is come up with ruthenium compounds that are volatile to transport, mm -hmm. but also 
least in theory, do the right chemistry to give you ruthenium under your reaction conditions. So do you have light? Do you have ions? Do you have heat? <clears throat> so we can work with that. And we understand the mechanisms by which our chemical compounds decompose under all those conditions. Mm -hmm. And we can give you something that is at least say mostly ruthenium if ruthenium is what you want. Oh, that is so cool. Oh my God. Because back in the day when I was an active researcher, I also did a chemical weapon deposition of graphene, but I also did a lot of like sputtering and uh, all these kinds of, you know, physical vapor depositions, mm -hmm. not the chemical vapor deposition. Right, right. But I guess you you focus on the the the, the chemical weapon deposition. So um, iron based so magnetron sputtering is not the one that your group not for what we're we're trying to do so for example if you want to make you want to 3d print a small metal structure right, right. and you want to do that with an electron beam you're not going to want to sputter because if you sputter the material goes everywhere mm -hmm. right? it's wonderful coating things coating substrates for example right but if you want to to 3D print, you need to spatially control where the chemistry occurs. True. And so one of the ways in which this is done is to use a scanning electron microscope. And so the electron beam is tightly focused for imaging, right? Mm -hmm. You're imaging small areas. Right. And if you think about it, as you uh, image with a focused electron beam, you're sweeping, say, you're sweeping a pattern left to right, up and down. Right. right. But if what you have is chemistry that works when it interacts with the electron beam, then if you imagine your electron beam is sweeping out a pattern, it's rastering, uh -huh. you turn the beam on and off while the chemistry is in place, right? Your molecules are in place. It's either going to deposit or not. Oh my God. And think about Think about how a 3D printer works with polymers, right? right? You're putting plastic, either put it down or not, as you sweep a pattern with the print head. Right. We're doing exactly the same thing with gas phase precursor and an electron beam. And since the electron beam is focused to nanometer size, you're basically printing as the electron beam goes on and off, but printing on the nanoscale. Oh my God, that is so cool. That's magic. Oh my God. I mean, it is magic, right? Yeah, but oh my God. And I so know. I have a slide. In, oh, wow. I have a slide in my presentations that shows, for example, a buckyball, uh -huh. right? So printed out of purple plastic with a print head and, and polymer. Right. And compared to a nanoscale buckyball of platinum that's been printed on the nanometer scale with an electron beam and a microscope. <gasps> Oh my God. Oh my God. That is so, so now this is the problem of podcast, which is only only sound, right? Oh <laughs> you my missed God. my slide of well, I'll send it to you. Yeah, please send it to me because uh the video version of the podcast is also available on YouTube. So I can plug the picture, I can show the picture there. Oh my god, that is so cool. <gasps> That is so cool. That is so cool. That is so cool. Oh, wow, wow, wow. Okay, okay. So, uh, okay, okay. So you can make a buckyball. So I'm assuming you can make, like, what is the toughest structure to make or oh, 3D print at a nanoscale with a scanning electron microscope from your perspective? Okay, so here I'm, I'm speaking to my collaborators because we, we're the chemistry end and they're the printing end. But if you think of something that's shaped where there's a vertical piece and then a horizontal piece comes off, uh -huh. so shape an angle or a letter gamma in the Greek alphabet, right. that's really hard to get the horizontal piece without it sagging or going off at the wrong angle. Uh -huh. So I hear from my collaborators. Right. Yeah, of course. You have, you have pre your, your your chemist precursor and the, they are the ones who are... Oh, that is so cool. Oh my God. That is so cool. Lisa. I'm so glad we have you on the podcast. Ah! So um tell me about tell me about how did how did this happen? How did Lisa become the crow professor and department chair at the University of Florida? How did that happen? In this like 3D <laughs> 
I have the standard academic pedigree, right? You know, BS from the University of Kansas, PhD from Caltech, <laughs> postdoc at Stanford, became a Stanford faculty member, moved to the University of Florida. But that's not the real story. You can read that off my CV. Yeah, no. right? We want the real stuff. Yeah. So, <laughs> so the real stuff is I actually went to the University of Kansas to become a pre-med, a medical doctor. And my academic advisor said, oh, you should start doing research in chemistry, right? If you're going to be a chemistry major. And I got into the lab. I did my first undergraduate research in the labs of Kristen Bowman James, who was a rare woman faculty member in a chemistry department in 1975. And I fell in love with chemical research and never looked back. I never even took the biology courses that would have led to a pre-medical track into medical school. Just no. Uh -huh. um, and so I switched over later on to work in a different lab doing organic chemistry. I love mechanisms. And uh, Kristen Bowman James was more of a structural person. Mm -hmm. So I started looking at, of all things, peroxide decomposition, went to graduate school, did mechanisting work, organic chemistry, right? No metals at all. Mm -hmm. And as a postdoc, I started to look at organometallic mechanisms because in, oh, should I confess the year? Yes. 1983, almost nothing was known about organometallic mechanisms. Mm -hmm. But I still think about things as a physical organic chemist, right? What happens in the reaction? Now I think about bond strengths. You know, what are the weakest bonds? How does the reaction go? Mm -hmm. And I started to do that as an independent academic. I was looking at organometallic photochemistry. Mm -hmm. And just kept looking at mechanisms until one day I was talking to someone after a seminar. Uh, it was a seminar about chemical vapor deposition with tungsten hexacarbonyl depositing tungsten, right? Mm -hmm. and I thought about some compounds we were making for totally other reasons, uh, which had metal nitrogen multiple bonds. And I thought, you know, if you did the same thing, maybe you could make tungsten nitride out of this. Mm -hmm. So I, I called up a friend in chemical engineering and asked him, is tungsten nitride good for anything? And there was this long pause and an expletive at the other end of the phone, which I won't repeat for your podcast. <laughs> and he said, do you know how to deposit tungsten nitride? I said, maybe. <laughs> right. <laughs> And it turns out that at the, that was the exact moment when chip manufacturers were moving from aluminum metallization to copper. So metallization is the wiring in a computer chip. Uh -huh, uh -huh. And it turns out that copper migrates all over everywhere uh, if you don't confine it in what's, with what's called a diffusion barrier in your chip. Mm -hmm. And copper is a mess where aluminum is not. Uh -huh. And so... Tungsten nitride was one of the candidate materials for barrier materials for chip manufacturing. And I had no clue, right, that this could actually be something valuable. This is why you talk to other people. Yeah. <laughs> and he and I started a collaboration, which lasted, I don't know, for 20 years and probably 50 or 60 papers mm -hmm. on chemical vapor deposition of metal nitride films. Oh, wow. And this the technique eventually moved to my lab. When he retired, we stole all of his equipment out of chemical engineering with permission. We moved it all up the hill. We do this in my own lab, uh, regular CVD at this point. Uh -huh. Okay, so then we started looking at precursors for CVD because we knew how to do mechanism-based stuff. And then other people started talking to me like, can you do electron beam precursors? And my response was pretty much like the like the nitrides, like there's electron beam deposition. What? <laughs> and, but we got drawn into it. Uh -huh. uh, same thing with photochemical deposition, although we did know something about photochemistry. We didn't know you could do deposition with it. Mm -hmm. And so all of my friends have drawn me into these other areas collaboratively. And then all of a sudden we became the go to people for any technique you wanted, right? Because we were willing to try these things that we thought they were weird, but they sounded interesting. And, and that's where all the electron beam deposition and ion beam deposition works similarly, except with ions instead of electrons. Right. 
And now we have this whole portfolio of precursors and here we are. Wow. That is, oh my God. So how did, okay. Wow. 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 That's quite a journey. So you wanted to be a medical doctor. Or... Yes. Oh, okay. uh, but yeah. Decades ago. Decades yes. ago. But I'm so happy you did not become the medical doctor and you are rather. I am too. You, are... you know. I, I'd have died of COVID, right? So <laughs> as a medical doctor, my age. Um, so, this, yeah, so it's really been a, a kind of a random walk through science, but the dots all connect, right, from one place to another. Yeah. But I ended up in a very different scientific space than the one I expected to be in. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, I can imagine. I mean, I did not know that there is, I mean, of course there is like, I've, I'd heard about the nano uh, 3D printing with, uh, with, with, uh, with electron microscopes, but I didn't think that of course you need a precursor. And it, of, course, uh, of, course, God, of course, of course. And so what was done before people like me got involved in this yeah. is that people who wanted to do electron beam deposition bought chemical vapor deposition precursors. Right. So there's a wonderful story about platinum, all these platinum objects right. where um, if you're if you're a chemistry buff. Right. The go to precursor for chemical vapor deposition of platinum is methyl cyclopentadienyl platinum trimethyl. But that's nine carbons for every platinum atom. Mm -hmm. But you can buy that it's commercially available. It's volatile because people use it for CBD mm -hmm. and they do. They use it for electron beam deposition. Mm -hmm. But the CVD always has an additional reactant. It has either an oxidant like ozone or uh, O2 oxygen, mm -hmm. or it has a reductant like hydrogen. Right. And it turns out that the chemistry of ozone and the chemistry of electron beams are not the same at all. Right. And so you take this fabulous commercially available CVD precursor and you irradiate it with an electron beam and you get material that the stoichiometry is platinum to eight carbons. So you lose only one of the carbons. And so what you mostly make is nanocrystalline platinum embedded in a matrix of carbon. Oh, wow. And this is what they call platinum deposits. Sorry, guys. That's, That's not, not what that is. No, -uh, no. -uh. It's uh, and so I, I got involved when someone said, can you design a precursor that will have a higher platinum content mm. than, oh, you know, platinum C8? <laughs> <laughs> so let's start with not having that ring with the, uh, the six carbons at the top. And this is how we got drawn into this project. Uh -huh. And so then we had to start worrying about, well, what does an electron beam due to molecules, right? It's not what heat does to them. It's not what ozone does to them. And so then the mechanistic chemistry started coming into play. Aha, uh -huh. nice, nice. That, oh, wow. That, that is so cool. And I, I, I was actually also wondering how, how are you, I mean, you, you, your group uh, is like the expert in creating precursors out of thin air of course i'm dramatizing <laughs> um but i mean magic. Magic. yeah that's, that's how magic is um and i was wondering where does the semiconductor industry comes in but when you talked about your journey and this postdoc of yours and like hey what so that <laughs> makes sense now <laughs> well, I, can tell, I can tell you what they're paying us to do now yeah but I mean. um in terms of the uh electron and ion beam chemistry mm -hmm. The ability to write metal lines on the nanoscale comes up a couple of places in the semiconductor industry. One of them is in the, the repair of masks that are used for photolithography. Mm -hmm. yeah. right? So chip manufacturing involves a step where they shine light through a photo mask and develop a pattern on the chip. And of course, when these masks are defective, they will reproduce the defect on every wafer, which you don't really want to do. Mm -hmm. And so there's a process called mask repair mm -hmm. in which the masks for photolithography are imaged by scanning electron microscopy. Mm -hmm. uh, errors are 
cut out using an iron beam etch process. Mm -hmm. And then the lines can be rewritten correctly using either electron or iron beam deposition of, of metals yep. on the photo mask. Absolutely, yeah. Uh, so that's one place. The other place where it turns up is in what's called circuit edit, where you wouldn't want to do this in manufacturing, but if you're prototyping, you want one chip instead of a million of them. Mm -hmm. uh, if you discover that you really don't like which direction your metal lines are running, you could do the same thing. You can etch out areas with an iron beam and then rewrite metal into the, the areas for, for prototyping chips. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh -huh. um, what they're interested in in our chemistry is what's called area selective deposition, mm -hmm. where you lay down materials in one spot, but not another. It's an alternative to lithography. Uh -huh. right? And so we are looking at uh, processes where you can use light to generate reactive species from precursors, mm -hmm. and then they react with a substrate surface in one place, but not another. Uh -huh. And you can use that to make patterns of metals, for example. So this is a direct write process instead of write, etch, polish, etch, right? You know, all of what's usually seen in, in standard chip manufacturing. Right. It's basically printing at nanoscale. It's it's literally yes, printing exactly. at nanoscale. This, this is literally skipping, yeah, like saving yeah. the time, saving the uh, material that you need, the mass, the electron beam, the ion beam, the bunch of chemicals, yeah. all of that. Right, right, right. Polishing, depositing, etching, right? That sort of yes, thing. Yes, exactly. So this would be a direct process to put metal patterns down. Uh -huh. So does that mean that our electronics will get cheaper? Of course not. Yeah. No, I mean, they might, right? Because manufacturing always scales. <laughs> but, that was <laughs> but I'm assuming about anything that involves money, right? Yeah, that is true. Mm -hmm. But yeah, that sounds that sounds really, really cool. Oh my God. Oh my God. Okay. So Lisa, it's it, you have already told me so many projects and so many stories. Uh, which are so cool but if I have to if I have to like put you on the spot and ask you okay give me one uh, research project that you're most proud of and I know this is like a difficult it's like choosing asking okay which child is your favorite um, oh I love them all my children as well as the projects <laughs> I think the one that's most fun to talk about yes is electron and ion beam chemistry, the 3D printing on the nanoscale. Uh -huh. Because if I give talks to chemists, most likely they've never heard of this and it's the weirdest thing they've heard all week. But the visuals are so stunning, right? You have all these images of little 3D nano printed things. And you could say, oh, we develop chemistry that does this better because the people who can make these fabulous objects are not chemists. It's, it's not what they do, right? They buy precursors or get them from their collaborators like us. And so it's just, it's really fun to talk about it because if I talk about it in a, a nano uh, audience or a material science audience they're amazed by the chemistry they view synthetic chemistry as black magic mm -hmm. which it only sort of is um, and if you talk to about it talk about it to chemists they're fascinated by the printing and the objects because that's outside their area of expertise mm -hmm. so it's really a project that when you talk about it it has something for everybody to be amazed about mm -hmm. yeah absolutely so 3d printing uh, with an iron beam or electron microscope which either one we talked mostly about electron beam but ion beams can do the same thing right and so when people who know anything about ion beams they normally think of etching right yeah either etching a surface or cutting out a sample for tem yeah uh, they think of it as a destructive process yeah. right but you can actually deposit with ion beam as well. It's a similar setup as electron beam chemistry, but now you have a gas doser tube and a focused ion beam, a fib for those people who are familiar with it. Mm -hmm. And you can deposit things in that way, except here's what's interesting about ion beam deposition is you always get sputtering, etching, 
concomitant with the deposition. So it's two competing processes. You have deposition of material and etching of material. Mm. And if you're lucky, you can purify your deposit as you go, because if the impurities selectively etch or selectively sputter, the material you end up at the end with is purer than what you get with electron beam chemistry, where you don't get really that much etching. That that makes sense. Yes, that makes sense. I only knew, I mean, of course, for fib, like uh, in the destructive way, the ion beam, but like molecular beam epitaxy, they're also, they use ion beam, right? Molecular beam epitaxy, uh, where it's like you pull up oh. like the silicon crystal or I don't know, whichever crystal. But that no, but that method is different. I think there you start with your starting is like this one crystal and then you pull it out. Okay, no, that's a different thing. Sorry. Yeah, there's a whole bunch of different techniques depending on what you start with and what and, right? that's, that's <laughs> we could spend a whole podcast on just explaining the differences between techniques. Absolutely. So okay, let me ask you this. Which beam is your favorite? Like the light? Uh, ion or electron? So these projects all kind of run in different ways. I think at the moment, I'm kind of interested in the ion beam chemistry because it's newer to my group. Uh -huh. We started with electron beam uh, precursors. And then now we've gotten into comparing electrons and ions with the same precursor. Uh -huh. So that's kind of an, an interesting project to me because that gets into the real mechanism of what's going on. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so you can look at things like, for example, electrons come in with a lot of energy, but basically not much momentum because there's no mass to them, right? But ions come in with this big, huge ion bombarding your, your molecules. And so you can look at things like, does the mass of the ion matter? Yes, it does. Does the energy of the incoming ion matter? Yes, it does. Yes. Uh, can you compare it to what's going on with electrons? Yes, you can. And so you get a lot of really interesting mechanistic information out of comparing the two techniques. Right. So bringing in the ion has been very interesting for me. Ah, okay. That's that. that okay, yeah, fair enough. That makes sense. And now I'm interested in ion beam more as well. Thank you, Lisa. Great. I had my answer that it's the electron beam, but great. Now I'm interested in the ion beam as well. Oh, you biased my opinion. <laughs> but I mean, um, in my experience with the electron beams, uh, there is a lot of, uh, let's say, a deposition when I remember back in the day when we were doing SEM, TEM or uh, any other sort of, <laughs> yes. uh, it, as soon as like the longer you stay, the higher the energy of your electron beam is, the stronger the electron beam is, the more deposition of carbon from this vacuum environment you will get. Yes, yes. Uh, <laughs> you've just discovered FIBID, focused electron beam induced deposition accidentally which was the way it was discovered, really. It was discovered during imaging experiments uh -huh. that people were getting carbon crud on their sample, which is from the background hydrocarbons in the chamber. Exactly, exactly. That's that's it right there. <laughs> but but then, then but, uh, but how do you then use the electron beam? Like you must really have to do the magic to the, the precursor that you have, because in my head, if it is a chemical precursor, then it will just be, oh my God, there would be a lot of hydrocarbon, won't it, won't there? There will, there will. Yeah. And so one of the interesting things that we do is we, yeah. this is the royal we with our collaborators, uh -huh. compare what happens to a precursor in a working microscope with a gas doser, where you're at high vacuum and not ultra high vacuum, mm -hmm. with what happens to the same precursors with electrons on a surface in ultra high vacuum, mm -hmm. which is much cleaner. Exactly, yeah. And the answer is always that the carbon content will be higher in a real microscope because of the chamber background. Yeah. And you know that you're getting chamber background because you can make a precursor that has no nitrogen in the precursor. And if you do the deposition in an SEM, you'll see nitrogen in the deposit because there's nitrogen in the chamber background. Yes, yes, 
Absolutely. So when somebody says, can you make a perfect precursor to make perfect metal deposits, right? A hundred atom percent metal. My answer is always no, especially not if you're going to use it in your dirty microscope chamber. <laughs> <laughs> that is not my carbon. <laughs> <laughs> well, some of it is my carbon, but some of it is not my carbon. <laughs> and we've looked at this with the same precursor in different environments. And there, there is always background deposition. Okay. All right. We but... can make your life better if you want pure metal deposits, but it's not going to be perfect. No, it's, not, it's never going to be perfect, but it's still better than using uh, or creating the, the platinum nanostructures with this other precursor, which is... With a huge amount of carbon in the precursor. Exactly, yes. exactly. So we, we do know that. Right, yes. Okay, yeah, now that makes sense. Awesome, awesome. That makes sense. So, uh, Lisa, it's quite uh, clear to me that you love the research part of being a scientist and being a professor in your chair. I mean, it's just like, I love that. But what else do you like about being a scientist? I love working with students. Mm -hmm. Okay. So if you have the kind of faculty position that I have, uh, especially as a department head, you don't have time to do experiments with your own hands. Mm. And so what you really are is a, a teacher of students how to do research. Mm -hmm. And so at first, of course, you tell them, do this, do that, right? Because they're inexperienced, they don't realize. But there's a fabulous moment when the light goes on for the student <laughs> and suddenly their ideas about their project are better than yours. Oh. And I have never had a problem with teaching students who are smarter than I am, who have better ideas about the project, because if you're training them correctly, you get that, right? And I would certainly hate to think that I personally am the acme of this field. Eek, that's awful. <laughs> I should be training people who can do it better than I can. Yeah, yeah. And so I... That is one of my favorite things about this is when the light goes on and it's their project instead of mine. Ah, uh, yeah, that's that's such a, that's so nice to hear and it's very heartwarming. Uh, and yeah, I can imagine that that moment where it's like, yeah, you got it, you got it, you made this happen. <laughs> wow, that's a really good idea. You should do that. <laughs> yeah, you should do that. That's really good. Wow. Yeah, that is a good point. We, I, I can tell you, we have never had this on the podcast. So you're the first uh, guest. We've had like 100 guests on this podcast, but we have never had this answer. Of course, we have had the answer that, yeah, I like to be a mentor. I like to work with students and da 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 da. But this particular, to this detail, ah, ah, this is, you're absolutely right. I love that. I love that. So, um, Lisa, it sounds to me that your research experience has been wonderful because I feel like we only talked about the highlights of your career. But I'm sure, of course, of course, of course. Duh. Um, but if you have three wishes to improve your research experience, what would you ask for? And they can be anything, okay? Ask for a coffee machine for all I care. But hey, I can't promise anything, okay? I'm not promising anything here. Three wishes, go. <laughs> Well, I'd like to have more time to work on it. As a department head, my time is fragmented. And so getting getting time to sit down and really think about things in a meaningful way is hard to achieve. Mm -hmm. um, I Yes, I would like that. So maybe I should get rid of my administrative job. Wait, what? Um, my department has almost 500 people on the payroll, if you include the graduate students. Oh my God. So it, it's a large administrative task and we have a good administrative structure. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of professional staff who do the, so many of the things I don't want to do. Uh -huh. right? Okay. But it, it's, it's still extremely time consuming. Mm. So there is that. Um, the other thing that I would like to have is people would give me research funding that I didn't have to write grant proposals oh, for. Yes. There are people who tell me that they love to write grant proposals. I don't believe that. When I sit down and think that is Bullshit. utter. Mm, mm -hmm. I, uh, so personally, I hate to write grant proposals. I just absolutely hate it. And it's a good thing that I percentage wise am moderately successful so that I don't have to spend all my time writing unsuccessful grant mm -hmm. proposals. I don't I don't bat a thousand as they say in baseball. I don't get a hundred percent yield. 
but I do pretty well. Uh So I, I utterly hate that. Mm -hmm. Um, so, and and the the last thing is it, it would be really more time to work with students, which is kind of the same first answer again. Mm-hmm. But I love to work directly with students. Oh, okay. And as as a department chair, I don't teach in the classroom. That's the one thing that goes away out of my schedule. But I do have a fairly large research group for somebody in this position. I have 14 graduate students and four undergraduates who work in my group. So I'd like to have more time to, to actually work directly with students. And that that time has gone down as I've become an administrator as well. Very realistic wishes. I want to say they are realistic, even if I know they are not, because we would, I think we would continue to have to write grant proposals. And for some reason- That's really sad. Yeah, that's really sad. And I really, I agree with you. I think people who say that they enjoy writing grant proposals, they are psychos. There's something wrong there. They may enjoy thinking about the project, but the actual writing Writing? part, Mm -mm. you, no. No, no. And then you need like recommendation letter, then you need the budget plan and then, uh, uh, -uh. Mm -mm -mm. no, not doing that. No, absolutely not. But no, all three very realistic quote uh, wishes. I hope they come true. Um, and a better coffee pot would be good too. Uh, okay, okay. <laughs> there we go. Of course, coffee, coffee is always there. Absolutely. Okay, so I hope all three of your wishes come true. I hope your admin work load goes down, uh, and you only do the things that you actually enjoy. Because there are some parts of admin that you probably do enjoy. I don't know. Uh, I do. I like hiring people. I like hiring faculty. Uh-huh. That's. Uh-huh. interviewing and hiring exactly i don't like all of the other bits <laughs> <laughs> um, let's talk about that hopefully next time you're on the podcast and yes you are coming again lisa that's happening <laughs> oh, <no>. for sure <laughs> hopefully by then uh you can give us an update on all of the, your three wishes um how it has improved let's just put it all out in the universe great wishes i hope i really hope i genuinely hope they do come through uh to not 100 percent but maybe 95 percent also okay uh, this has been wonderful lisa but before i let you go and do your thing be it admin be it science be it uh, uh supervising the, the the students or writing a grant proposal what can the followers expect in the week that you are taking over the real scientist nano twitter account Ah, well, early in the week, I thought I would introduce them to my research group, kind of a little bit of what we do. And then I was going to cycle through the projects kind of one at a time during the week, explain a little bit, as much as you can on Twitter. I'm not going to write long threads, <laughs> um, but I can come up with some visuals as a photo to go with it and maybe reference to a paper every now and then. We've written some review articles on some of these things that people could go look at if they're interested in the, the deep dive into any of these things. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Okay. All right. So we are going to get like an introduction in all different kinds of uh magical. I, I'm not going to let go of that word. I still <laughs> think your research is magical. It's just wow uh and i can't wait to read the review articles that you're going to plug and learn more about your research thank you very much lisa for taking the time this has been lovely looking forward to having you on real scientist nano my pleasure